Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Virginia SBDC's new webinar series, Beyond Google, Marketing and Managing on the Web. Some of you may have attended our Google the Great webinars, in which we explored the powerful tools that Google had to offer small businesses. This next series, Beyond Google, is designed to take a look at tools and techniques to help small businesses take their business to the next level on the web. Today's webinar, Making Green by Going Green on the Web. All of our Beyond Google webinars will be presented by Ray Sidney Smith, a self-proclaimed Googleologist and president of W3 Consulting, a digital strat business strategy firm that provides training on how to use various web-based technologies to small businesses. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those questions in the question window and Ray will do his best to answer them. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC Network for having me on to do these webinars, and hello to everybody. Today we're going to be talking about making green by going green on the web, and what I want you to take away from today are just a couple of points, some key information about what green is and, and how to do it, and uh, those things are, of course, how small businesses can achieve the great rewards that big corporate giants do get through their green initiatives. We know that uh, two-thirds of Fortune 500 companies today publish corporate sustainability reports that was unheard of just even 10 years ago, and maybe just shortly thereafter it was sort of non-existent. So the reality is, is that you know, 333 of the, of the Fortune 500 companies are, are publishing corporate sustainability reports. It's really, really dramatic. And that means that we went from a fringe sort of uh, you know, community of, of people who were quote unquote green uh, about 20 years ago you know, in the 1970s and then uh, you know, sort of developed into sort of a fringe uh, about 20 years ago, and now we're basically mainstream. And so what I also want to talk about is really what are sustainable green business practices, why you want to be green. We're going to talk about green performance objectives and, what you, and how you actually develop those in the company, what steps you would, like to, you would want to take to implement your green programs and initiatives, and then of course talking about some pitfalls like greenwashing and substandard green practices. And all of this is in the context of how you can actually make some money, save costs, increase employee engagement, and of course help the environment all together in one. So our agenda for day, today is going to be who are the buyers? We're going to talk about who the buyers are in the market today. And then we're going to talk about the green rewards, how, how and what are the big green rewards in the green marketing world. And then of course we're going to talk about green strategy, and then I'm going to fuse that right into using the web for that green strategy. And then we're going to be talking about avoiding green uh, pitfalls and green washing. And we'll wrap it up with question and answer. So again, as Tracy said, feel free to ask questions using the question panel uh, through GoToWebinar. And uh, Tracy will go ahead and you know, uh, alert me, and I'll be able to answer any questions, hopefully, that you have. Or I'll follow up afterward with uh, answers to any of them that, that I don't know. So I'm going to start off with, of course, a book that I think is really fantastic and is sort of the primary source material for a lot of what I'm talking about today. It's called The New Rules of Green Marketing. It's a book by Jacqueline Ottman. She is someone who is on Madison Avenue as, a, as sort of a big market marketer, big product marketer, and she took that uh, in the sort of Madison Avenue product marketing world and she uh, stepped out into the green movement and really applied all of that to the green movement. And it came out with this book called The New Rules of Green Marketing. She came up with 20 new rules, and uh, I'm, I'm not going to go all over all of them, but if you go to this link W, and that is a single W before the period, dot w3cinc.com forward slash NR Green Marketing, that will take you to the book. And uh, Jackie has been so wonderful to give us a discount from her, through her publisher, the publisher has been able to give a discount to anyone who wants to purchase the book. It's not an affiliate link or anything like that. I don't get any money for it. I just really, really like the book, and I think that you'll really enjoy it as well. But some of the really basic tenets of what she talks about in the book, just sort of one of the first five tenets, is that values guide consumer purchasing today. And to quote her, historically, consumers bought solely on price, performance, and convenience. But today, how products are sourced manufactured, packaged, disposed of, and even such social aspects as how factory and farm workers are treated all matter. What that means, you know, in, in Jackie's words is what it, what it means is that in essence everyone is a green buyer today. 
in, in large part, 83% of people in, in today's economy identify as some shade of green. So we're all buying green in some way, shape, or form. And if we're not, we're still socially conscious about what we're purchasing. So in essence, we all have to really pay attention to what's happening in the market. So the 20 rules, of course, cover a whole gamut of things. But really, the, the primary tenets of the new rules are that you know green is mainstream today. Green is cool, but it's not a fad. It's lasted a long time, and it's going to endure. And green products not only typically work equally or better than the products, it has to. And they typically are going to be worth a premium price. That is, you're going to make more money for, for taking the, doing the hard work and problem solving to make something not only have great price performance and convenience, but also have an environmental impact that is lessening its environmental impact. So you really want to pay attention to that. Also, uh, I had the luxury uh, or the pleasure of interviewing Jackie back in September of last year. And you can find that interview there at www.3br.biz. So if you want to go ahead, you can find that interview there. It's really wonderful to hear Jackie talk about all of the things that she has and has to offer with regard to the this green marketing movement that she really has been a part of and has burgeoned, you know, she sort of she sort of led the movement in, in, in many ways, especially as it relates to product marketing and she talks about service marketing and so on and so forth. So really, really great book and I recommend that you go and uh, check it out. So who are the buyers? Uh, as you can see across here, one of the things that Jackie talks about in the book is this idea that we sort of have this, these five sort of categories of purchasers. This comes from the National Marketing Institute, and these are all their terms, what they call lojas, natural lights, drifters, conventionals, and then the unconcerns. And I just want to give you a, a basic overview of what those are so that we could understand them and then move on, because it's really pivotal that you do understand who these people are in a lot of ways. So you probably can't read the little tiny text on the screen at the moment, but really, in, in essence, the first column are the lojas. And the lojas are those people who are really dedicated to the environmental cause. They're the ones who are going to make it a, a part of their lifestyle, and they're going to do everything possible to make sure they, they influence the green and social marketing movement. Okay? So they're going to they're do what's called pro-cotting. That is when you know, boycotting is, of course, uh, you know, not serving or, you know, or, or uh, purchasing products from, from someone who you dislike or, or don't want to purchase from for some particular reason. Well, they do the opposite. They pro-cut. They will only buy from those sources where they understand that they are environmentally and socially responsible. That is, that they are fair trade and that they're doing the right things. They're properly sourced, properly maintained, and properly disposed of when the products are, are coming to the table. Naturalites are a little bit different. Naturalites are not so environmentally conscious, they are health conscious. They are very much about doing things that are going to be healthy for them and their children, and then secondarily, that's going to be sort of in the green movement. So as you understand it, when we talk about green, many times it bleeds over into other areas like health and wellness, into the social realm, which is fair trade, social justice, economic justice, that type of stuff. So it's sort of a, a sort of a you know a melding uh, you know sort of a melding pot, but we we generally term all of that stuff under the umbrella of green sometimes. Drifters are those people who are just sort of there because they know it's happening in the marketplace, and so therefore they're willing to identify with it because it's something that's happening and moving themselves toward the sort of mainstream. And so they're just brought into the green space and they're comfortable with it. And so they sort of make it part of their lifestyle if it's easy for them. And so if they're gonna if they're gonna see a product come on the market, it's going to it's if it's got a green aspect to it, they'll purchase that above something else purely because it represents for them something that they understand is uh, chic and they're gonna be sort of, you know, uh, keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. Conventionals are typically classified as the baby boomers, as an older generation, and uh, that, though that's not necessarily the case, I mean, there can be conventionals who are not, but those are people who are very much about waste not, want not, and they're all about making sure that everything is practical and rational and you're not wasting a thing, and uh, of course, they're cost-driven. They want to make sure that they're not spending 
as 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 much as they need to, uh, you know, not nearly as much as they need to. They want to make sure that they're saving money and that they're, of course, going ahead and doing well. These are people who are typically well educated, and therefore they have above average income and really make very good uh, choices about these things. They also plan a, a lot. And then there's the final category of people who are the unconcerns, uh, and the unconcerns are the folks that just don't really have any, uh, you know issue with environment or society, they just sort of float along. And they represent a very small sliver of that percentage. So 83% of them fit into these four categories, and this final you know, sliver fits into that other 17. So uh, that's, that's really the dynamic we're dealing with here in the green market, just so that we have uh, a basic understanding of that. So those are who the buyers are. The big green rewards. The big green rewards are those things that grab the headlines. And it's really important for us to take note of the fact that big corporations, when they do green initiatives, they get the big headlines. And what we have to do as small business, and especially small business in Virginia, is make sure that we ride that PR wave. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the reality is we have to ride that wave on the local level when these big national and regional things happen in the green movement. So it's not that they're going, it's not that you want the big headlines, you want to capture the wave of the trends that are happening when that happens, and we'll talk about that. Remember, as the second tenet of the big green rewards is that sustainability and profitability is all about reducing big risks and then capitalizing on big rewards. The big risks, of course, are, for a business, cost, and then, of course, your product and service getting out there to the market. You can lower costs through green, and you can also add value to the product and service, which means that you have a more marketable product, which enhances your marketing efforts and your brand at the same time. And sometimes your product itself helps you know, reinforce some other weakness in the company. You know, so if you, do a, if you do a SWOT analysis, forgive me, I hear a lot of static. Does, does everyone hear a lot of static in the background? Perhaps it's just me. Uh, if, if you want to message Tracy and let me know if there's a if you have static in the background, I know I hear some. Anyway, so remember that you want to make sure that you go ahead and also capitalize on big rewards, which is attracting better customers and employees. And again, if you are attempting to be genuineness, you know, you have genuineness of assent to the green movement, then you're of course going to have more customers who are going to, to be like-minded and are going to fall in line with you and are going to uh, you know, adopt and protect you, you know, they're going to insulate you from down cycles in the economy and or a specific market. They're going to protect you because they're going to buy from you because they're going to do those things like procotting you over someone else who is not green. And then of course your employees. You want to make yourself look great to employees when you're looking for staff in the marketplace around you in your local or regional area and you want to make sure that that is something that of course is uh, in, you know implied and so you want to go ahead and make sure that employees know that you are green focused that you're socially and economically you know focused so that they are going to be protected in the overarching in the overarching you know perspective of the corporate culture so those are the big rewards of course, businesses have risks, and green helps in all of those areas. So first and foremost, it helps decrease operating costs many times. A lot of people think that you know, going green, of course, costs more money, and that does happen in the consumer market, but very infrequently does that happen actually in the green market. Really, in the green market, it's about thinking about problems and solving them versus increasing costs because something has a premium because it's green. Uh, second is, of course, enhanced corporate culture, enhanced employee health and productivity, building your business reputation, and, of course, reducing your environmental regulatory risks. Many people are putting wastes and so forth out there, and you are, of course, causing yourself open to environmental regulatory issues uh, by doing that. So let's talk about green strategy, and then we're going to get into, into the web. But I really want to discuss this because it's really important for us to understand what we're doing on the web in terms of strategy. So there was a, a report out there by the New York Enterprise Report, and they put together the things that they felt were some really great ideas for helping a business become more environmentally friendly. And uh, these are some green business 
uh, you know, performance objectives, create performance objectives. And so they list them here. They're too small for you, but I'll, I'll provide the, uh, the link for this in the recorded version afterwards so that you can check it out. But some of the items that are on here are just really easy and practical, and they have in here how they actually impact you. And so when you're thinking about how you're going to do performance objectives, you really have to think about this on the level of what is it that you can do as a business, okay? And then make those steps accordingly. So here, this chart, of course, talks about minimizing environmental impact. Well, of course, minimizing environmental impact can happen on the hyperlocal, which is right within my office, my employees, their air quality, those types of things, expanding that to your building, expanding that to your lot, expanding that to your street, the, if you're in an old town district, expanding that to your city, region, and state, and then of course the globe. Uh, so we're, we, we, can, we can think about it from many, many different levels. And so the level of green you are is really dependent upon your objectives and how much you can really do at any particular time. So in essence, I'm telling you to plan. You need to plan to make sure that you can go ahead and make sure that the performance objectives that you create can be uh, you know, executed properly and then maintained sustainably. You don't want to do something where you're going to backpedal on it in six months and say, ah, oh, forget that. We're not going to do that anymore because it's just too much work or effort. Do what you can do and always plan for future progress. And so I'm saying start small and make your way forward. So here goes a couple of things that you can do that are really great initial green performance objectives that I think almost every business can do, whether you're a product or service-based business, you can make these things happen and sort of grow along the way. So the first item I really usually talk about is choosing green office and clean product, cleaning products. Many times you'll find that a lot of these products have all sorts of volatile chemicals in them that are sitting around your office. And uh, they are not only affecting the environment, but they're also affecting the health of your employees and yourself. And you're taking those chemicals back to your homes and to your children and uh, spouses. And so it's a really important thing for you to think about how that's really impacting you on the hyperlocal level. That's your own self-interest. But then how is it affecting what you're doing in your business environment, how it's affecting your customers, and how it's affecting the environment? So these green products typically are natural products that can be that biodegrade, uh, that are bio-based as they're called. You know, they're, they're made from natural products and therefore they break down very easily. And they don't cause any, any sensitivities to the people that are around them. Uh, this comes to toner cartridges and the cleaning products that you use in the bathrooms uh, and so on and so forth. And uh, many times you can now find them, they've come down in price so much that now they're almost on par, if not cheaper, than the regular products that are out there, especially through large distributors that are your every other distributor, you know, the, the basic manufacturers, but they've just gone ahead and repro reproduced their products to be green, okay? Next is, of course, a recycling program. We've all heard throughout our upbringing the concept of reduce, reuse, recycle, and of course, we've sort of gone backwards in that order. We've done recycle, and then we've done uh, reuse, and we haven't gotten to the reduce yet part at all in our society. But reduce, reuse, recycle really is what we're looking for, in essence, to do. And so start off with recycling, and then you can get to the reuse part, which there are all sorts of ways you can do that. But start with recycling. Figure out how your building and or municipality recycles. Sometimes there are, are credits that are given to you tax-wise or uh, for zoning permits or that type of thing. So check with your local uh, zoning office as well as your local uh, sanitation department and see if there aren't some benefits for being able to do that. Some jurisdictions require it. So you have to recycle if you're in some particular jurisdictions, especially in Virginia. And so you want to make sure that you go ahead and figure out your recycling program. I know that in my own office some years ago we had a recycling program where we didn't have a building recycling program, but we decided to take that the, those recycling products back to our own homes and recycle them as part of our own residential recycling program. So even if you don't have it as part of your building program, you can do that on a hyper-local level and go ahead and, and take care of recycling uh, within and you know with sort of the staff involved and so on and so forth. And of course, it's really important for you to involve everybody in this process, and I'll talk about that shortly. Next up is finding a LEED certified office space. 
And while you might think that's sort of crazy to just up and move, uh, I'm, I'm not telling you to do that, but certainly when you are looking for office space and or thinking about you know, the end of your terms, you might want to talk and encourage your building owner, uh, whoever your landlord is, to get LEED certified. LEED is a, a program that is here, just a slide for it, it's called Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. And this is produced by, this is a widely recognized and widely used green building program uh, worldwide. And it basically tells you how green your building is. This is a program of the U.S. Green Building Council. And the U.S. Green Building Council, or the USGBC, is committed to a, a prosperous and sustainable future through cost efficient and energy savings green buildings. This is from their website. And what they do is they have the LEED Green Building Program and they basically tell you how green the building is on a platinum, gold, silver, and so on and so forth levels. And they give you a point based system so that you can say, oh, if I build a a roof that's energy efficient, put in energy efficient windows, proper sealant, low flow faucets, and so on and so forth. It builds up the credits for these lead platinum, lead gold, lead silver, and so on and so forth. But what that ends up meaning is that you have less energy cost. You have greater, you know, uh, less environmental impact in general, healthier employees, and so on and so forth. It's all just beneficial to everyone. And again, this is great marketing. To be able to say that you're in a LEED certified building is really you know, something that you can leverage in so many different communities. Uh, this, in 2012, uh, the U.S. Green Building Council published a list of the top 10 states that were LEED certified. And it turns out that the Virginia is uh, the top state. The D.C. ranks as number one because it has the, the largest square footage per capita per, per uh, you know, square foot. But Virginia is the top state. It is, uh, you know, uh, it is the um, the number of projects is 170. It has uh, 29.7 million square feet of LEED certified space. So there is a lot of space in Virginia that is LEED certified, and more to come. And so, if you're looking for office space, perhaps LEED certification, you know, LEED certified building is something that you want to look for, as well. Uh, it's, it's funny uh, that I, I was reading this the other day that uh, Cooper Vineyards in Louisa, Virginia is the first winery on the East Coast to achieve LEED Platinum, which means that if you have a business where you own the property or you have a vineyard or you have a, a piece of farmland with buildings on it, you might want to think about getting LEED certified yourself because that, of course, helps solidify you in that market, especially if you're in the farming or food agri agribusiness world, even agritainment you might want to you know, expose yourself through, uh, through that. So lead certified office space or otherwise. Replacing equipment as they are aging. So if you, uh, you, know, you have to replace a microwave, make sure that it's energy efficient, that it has the Ener Energy Star label. label. You want to go ahead and make sure that that's with all the equipment from your printers to your computers and so on and so forth. Look for that Energy Star label and then you know that the, the uh, federal government's program has at least certified that it's using the least amount of energy and providing you with the same benefits. Okay, so those are some just basic green performance objectives that you can establish. And again, the criteria is when can we make it happen? Plan it out. Make sure that you can continue it on. That is, you can make it a sustainable program. And then, of course, it's all about data and metrics and benchmarking. So it's about coming back to these performance metrics, uh, performance objectives, and seeing what you've done how much you've done and how much you can do more, say, on a semi-annual or an annual basis. You really want to look at how you're doing these things and you know, being able to communicate that in your marketing and messaging. So in 2011, the Wall Street Journal had an, this forum, this conference called Economics, and they put together four questions that they wanted these big corporations to answer in terms of questions. The questions I've modified slightly for our audience, but the basic questions were, how do you drive change that is in the uh, environmentally friendly green market, whatever you want to call it? How do you market environmental issues effectively? How do you market green, basically, effectively? How do you choose the right technologies in, environmental, in the environmental area? And how do you deal with regulator, re regulators, re regulatory issues, regulatory affairs? And I you know, after reading all the materials and so on and so forth, I took away these six items, and they're really, really great 
pieces to take away from here. And I think these are sort of some of the, the litmus tests for, for successful green business uh, initiatives. So one, it doesn't matter where it starts. This came from one of the executives. But you need the owner support and employee read readiness. So basically, corporate culture needs, to, the organization needs to be ready. Everyone in the organization needs to be ready. And CEO, president, business owner, sole proprietor, whoever's the owner needs to both be involved. So you can start anywhere, but you've both got to be you know, working in partnership. Number two was reason drives the decision, but emotion will drive the action. So that means you've got to get people excited about this. You've got to get excited about it. You have to be excited about it or else it's just going to be another failed program. Uh, you need to really be excited about it because if you're not excited about it, why is your employer staff going to be excited about it? Now, it usually does come from one individual who you know, sort of sparks that. So if it's coming from your employee, well, then you've got to get excited with your employee and make all of that happen. And of course, be logical, but use that excitement. Third is make it a team effort. This sort of lens on number two, but really what we're talking about here is going to everybody. Every layer of your business needs to be involved in the greening of your business. So go to your affinity partners, go to your referral sources, suppliers, employees, and customers, and make sure that they're all involved in the process. The more you communicate that with them, again, the more you're going to create that bond with them on, on that level, and that's going to protect you from them going to some other competitor who is going to create that bond with them outside of you? Okay, so if you're going to have to if you're going to have to uh, compete on price, then you're going to you're going to lose a lot of the time if your competitor undercuts you. But you're not going to do that if there's a value add to that that really speaks to your customers, which can be the green movement. Keep it simple. That's pretty self-explanatory. And the next one is probably the most difficult one for people to really process, but it's the, the 360 degree process concept, the cradle to grave. What this means is, is that you look at every stage in which your product or service touches the market and you look at how you can green it. So this comes from materials acquisition, basically taking resources from wherever they come from, the processing and manufacturing of those products, the assembly, the packaging, then the transportation and distribution of that product, not only from the factory but to the, to the store shelves, from the store shelves to the customer, and then the product use with the customer. That in Jack Gottman's book, she talks about the idea that you have to actually educate your customer how to effectively use the product so that it doesn't waste energy and that they don't misuse the product or misdispose of the product. So if they dispose of the product in a way in which it's not going to be environmentally friendly when they're done with it, then you've really missed the boat. And you have to do the hard work of teaching your customers that there is a particular way in which they can go ahead and reuse, recycle, or properly dispose of that product to be able to make it environmentally, uh, the least environmentally impact, impacting. So then you take it to the re resource recovery level, which is that can this product be taken from a reuse or recycling perspective and brought back to core parts and then be reused in the processing and manufacturing uh, level? And so you really want to think about how it goes through that entire circle of life. And the life cycle of your, of your product or service uh, is going to determine how much problem solving, what your green performance objectives are going to be, and how you're going to eco-innovate, as Jackie Oppen calls it. So you really want to think about how you're going to do that and, and make it effective. Okay? And then finally, creativity, creativity, creativity. Really think outside of the norms when it comes to sustainable uh, you know, innovation. Think about things in, in the perspective of, you know, ways that they haven't been used before. Uh, Jackie, when I saw her speak at the last Green Festival in New York last year, she actually used an example of toothpaste. Uh, she talks about one day toothpaste will be different than what we think of it. Today, we think of it as toothpaste and a toothbrush, but toothpaste and toothbrushes create lots of landfill use, right? We have containers of tubes and we have toothbrushes. But if we flip that on its head and we actually go ahead and think about a sort of like, do you remember Banaka, that, that spray in your mouth? It's sort of like uh, Listerine mints or whatever they might be, Tic Tacs. Well, think about a spray that you actually spray on your food and it actually uh, you know, is a bio-based product that actually when you eat, it is cleaning your teeth while you're eating. It doesn't affect the taste or flavor of your, of your food uh, or, the, or the enjoyment of your food but it's actually doing the work of what a toothbrush would do 
and there's real R&D right now going into effect. Someday brushing your teeth will, have, will look sort of like, you know, what the Neanderthals used in terms of making a fire. So, you know, it's really interesting that, you know, we use eco-innovation to really change the paradigm of society. And that's what you have to do with your products and services. You really need to look at how they're going to be able to be flipped on their head and still work great for everybody. Price, performance, and convenience, and environmental impact, or lessening the environmental impact. All right, so I gave you a little bit of overview of green, green performance objectives, green strategy, and now I want to talk about some of the real techniques of using green on the web. And I'm going to look at this from sort of a different lens, probably not what most people perceive as green, and I'm doing that on purpose because I, I want to, again, I want to get you thinking about this in a different perspective. So let's talk about green in a, in a very different perspective, and first we're going to start, of course, with social media. The social and mobile marketing movement has been happening for quite some time, and if you've attended prior webinars of mine, you probably have heard me talk about how social media has impacted small business marketing and certainly social networking in general that is outside of the concept of social media, but in real world, social network analysis, sociology, like people interacting with people is uh, fundamentally changed by social and mobile media. And so, it's only, it only makes sense that we apply that in the green marketing movement. So what we want to do in social and mobile marketing as it relates to the green movement is we want to do two things. One, if you're green throughout your business, when something big happens, going back to my first thought about the big green rewards, what you really want to think is when those big things happen, you can join the conversation and catch the wave as the topic trends in social media and beyond. So you always want to be searching in social media for those big trending things that happen so that you can be there when it happens. So for instance, if Unilever or you know, the, uh, the current uh, Unilever just did this big thing, they own the Axe brand, the body deodorant shot, you know, and, and showering stuff and whatnot. And they had this big campaign that was really funny. It was just hilarious and they, everybody liked it, you know, whatever, but it was all about uh, they, they talked about sharing the shower together to save water or something like that. And it was really funny and, and it caught wave. Well, a smart green marketer would have been prepared at that time to, to catch the wave of that media frenzy and get in there and start discussing how their business was green using the big corporate initiative there as an umbrella and context within to talk. Because remember, the web is all about keywords, and so if you can attach yourself to green or sustainable or eco-friendly while something else is happening, you're much more likely to be seen in the context of that, even if it's not exactly the same thing. So you might have a carpet cleaning business, but the green you know, shower stuff is related to perhaps water, water use, and carpet water, you know, cleaning uh, the carpet with water, and or, uh, you know, the bio-based, uh, you know, uh, uh, manufacturing process or whatever it might be that are related to each other, use those pieces to pull them together and make a, a great marketing impact because something big is happening and you should be in there. Now, what do you want to do right now in order to make sure that you're poised for that? You want to make sure that when those prime opportunities occur, you're prepared with what I call a, a media kit, a social and mobile media kit. And what that is is sort of like, you know, once upon a time you had a media kit, you sent it off to the press when you wanted them to have all of the right things, your bio, the company, you know, uh, uh, you know information which can include your uh, KPIs and all sorts of other stuff. And, you know, you, you basically provide them with all of this information. Well, today in the social and mobile world, you want to make sure that you have pre-prepared blog posts, tweets, Facebook page posts, Google Plus and LinkedIn updates, all with photos and videos prepared so that you're ready when those things happen and you can shine in the media's eyes. So the media is going to look to you as soon as those things happen. They're going to do those searches online. Journalists of all people have, have really uh, attached themselves to the green market. And so media is green today. And uh, that's something else that's talked about in, in the Jackie Ottman book in the New Rules of Green Marketing. And so they're going to they're gonna immediately look to the web and search for you. You've got to be there and be found so that you can get caught up in the, in the, you know, the larger perspective 
of the discussion that's happening on the web. So this is, you know, this is not about national news. This is about being picked up in your local paper, your regional newspaper, your regional websites, uh, like patch.com and so on and so forth. Those places that are going to capture you as well as being shared and syndicated among various social media, from your blog to somebody else's to their other Facebook pages and, and people tweeting about you. You want to be able to have all that ready and prepackaged for every area of your business that you're greening. So if you decide that you have six performance objectives for this year, I see you having at least six media kits that are all prepared and ready to go out so that when the big news hits, because it will, there's always some big company trying to do something innovative in, the, in that market now, you know, whether it's e-waste or u-waste or some kind of eco-innovation, you've got to be there to make that, um, make that impact happen. Okay? Next up is, of course, greening your IT. And this is the idea that you have uh, inf information technology, and the sustainable information technology field is out there. This particular image comes from a company called Green IT, and they're actually at greenit.net. Ignore the image credit there that .com is wrong. It's greenit.net, and what they do is they help you design, manage, and they educate you about green information technology. And so I would check out their website, greenit.net. It's a plethora of information, and they help you understand how energy is used by your technology. The, the biggest thing I can tell you here in terms of cost savings is that if you reduce your, your computers, get more laptops, you're going to get more bang for your buck, and you're going to reduce your, your, overhead, your overall carbon footprint. And of course, the carbon footprint is the amount of carbon that's created from energy sources. So we typically think about this as, you know, uh, if you think about a coal fi fire uh, power plant, it produces carbon that goes up into the air and causes global warming or whatever else it causes in terms of, uh, you know, respiratory issues in, in people and whatnot. We want to reduce that carbon off, off um, that carbon imprint, and uh, and then you know we want to we want to reduce that in, in general. But the bigger issue for me is that this is a really great marketing opportunity. If you, over time, replace all of your computers in the office with laptops, today laptops are just as powerful as any desktop that you're going to buy at a, a big retailer or online. And you can go ahead and get the laptop. And that laptop is going to be mobile, so therefore your staff can be mobile. You have greater flexibility in terms of where you can work as a, as a business owner, so you have that flexibility. It certainly is much more um, competent for you to be able to uh, change and be adaptable. And you want to use all of those things in your marketing materials. You want to basically poise yourself as a nimble comp company that's capable of doing things. I wouldn't necessarily use the word nimble or, or you know, shifty or anything like that if you were a financial advisor or an attorney or something like that. But, uh, but certainly if you are trying to stay in that sort of forward-thinking, progressive uh, you know, mindset when you're, when you're addressing your customers, know that a, a, a laptop is going to provide less landfill. It's going to do those things that, are good, that I talked about in terms of carbon imprint. It's going to, it's going to provide you with more flexibility as, as, a, as a green business. And so use all of those pieces in your marketing as well. Because everybody wants to know how you're saving money, that is saving the environment, but in essence you're saving money because laptops are typically cheaper and they use less energy and they're good for the environment. That's a win-win-win. And so next up is that once, you, once you've decided what kinds of green technologies you might want, and some of you will still want a server in your, in your business and will need it, and so some, somebody like Green IT can help you, you may not need it if you're a solopreneur or if you're a small business that doesn't necessarily need a server. If you don't have any uh, industry-specific software, you might go with one of these products, Google Apps for Business. I've talked about this in prior webinars, so those are archived there on the virginiaspdc.org website. And so you can check out the Google Apps engine and see what it can do. But basically, it's a server in the cloud. Microsoft has created their own office suite that you can do and use in the cloud, and Zoho is another one of those products. There are many different competitors in this space. But in essence, what it's doing is it's replacing the concept of the server. So now with a laptop and your mobile device, which is a smartphone or your feature phone, you can basically get business done anywhere, from anywhere, as long as you're connected to the internet and that's becoming far more readily available than it ever has in history. And so you're capable of connecting 
and not having all of these servers running at, at all at all hours. One of the main tenets of green IT is, of course, to shut computers off when they're not being used, and that's something that laptops do really well. And uh, you can get software on your desktops to do these things as well. But typically, laptops are designed because they are battery based to have better power saving mechanisms. So they're just sort of, you know, this is sort of preset for you in, in essence, and so you don't have to really think about it too much. They'll auto dim the screens, they'll shut off after a particular period of time, and uh, they're, they're just much more flexible in that regard. So look to these products if you want to be able to have infrastructure in the cloud, and then you can look to green IT otherwise. All right, so I want to talk about uh, a couple more things, and then I'm going to blast through some really cool products that can help you make some money. Okay, so next up is meeting online and teleworking. Teleworking is the idea that you have staff that will potentially not be working in your physical space at times. So if you have field workers, you already have, in essence, some kind of teleworkers uh, because they have to report back to you in some way, shape, or form, and it's most likely by phone or by email or otherwise, and so they're on the road. Uh, if you have a retail business or if you have an office space where people are working in, in, in that space, you might want to think about reducing your carbon imprint by shrinking your office size, taking over less space, and rotating people using a teleworking program. And actually sometime in the latter half of this year, we will be talking about uh, teleworking and we'll, we'll, we'll have a webinar on teleworking, so you can look forward to that and we'll, we'll have a whole webinar dedicated to having a small business teleworking program. But meeting online, helps you reduce a whole bunch of, of costs. Think about the travel costs, the wear and tear on your vehicle, and many of the other costs that are involved, including your time. Think about how much more you could bill in terms of hours or how many more products you can sell if you're standing in your store as opposed to having to go someplace a, a far distance in order to be able to make that sale and talk to your customers or provide customer service. So these are just a couple of tools that you can use, but there are many others on the market. Here I have Skype, which is owned by Microsoft, and it, it allows you to have audio and video uh, interactions with people. And you can have multiple people audio, so you can have that. And in essence, the Skype, as long as the other person has Skype as well, is free. You can Skype to Skype and it's completely free. If you wanted to have a phone number and other things, it's very inexpensive to be able to do that. You can, in essence, you know, replace some, if not all, of your phone infrastructure, your telecommunications infrastructure, and move it onto Skype. So there goes a huge cost savings that you might be able to be able to do. Uh, GoToMeeting is a product owned by Citrix, and GoToMeeting allows you to be able to have a, uh, you know, meetings very similar to what we're doing right now. We're using a Citrix product, GoToWebinar, and uh, this allows us to be able to have this communication. GoToMeeting is a little bit different. It allows you to be able to share uh, each other's screens and uh, see one another and those types of things. And so you can have this interactive live environment that can be really, really wonderful. Uh, Wigio, or Wigio, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, but Wigio is a really fantastic program. Wigio is a collaborative, uh, collaborative software, and it allows you to go ahead in and ad hoc start a conference call plus share documents and have a write board, which is a digital dry erase board where you can draw and doodle and show graphs and whatnot all in the same space and everybody can sort of draw on it together and brainstorm. It just is a really, really wonderful and flexible product and it's, and it's right now completely free. So take advantage of it. Again, this is reducing your travel, it's reducing your time, and it's giving you more time to think about sales and marketing. Uber Conference is a very new product and it's in beta right now. so take that as it will, but the product is really cool because what it allows you to do is to control your conference calling features from a web interface. So you can schedule conference calls online and then it calls, the, it calls you and it calls the people that are on the conference call at the time of the call. So I've been using it for the last couple of months with my client calls and so I never miss a conference call now because I am using this product in the cloud which you know, I would otherwise be having to remember that I have a conference call at 10 a.m. and I have to you know, remember a dialing number and a pin and you know, my notes and everything else like that. And now all I do is I schedule an Uber conference, it publishes it right into my, my calendar, and I set it and forget it. And now it calls me for, for you know, those purposes. And again, we've just reduced all sorts of energy that would otherwise have been used in terms of you know, 
my time on uh, you know the computer and all sorts of other things, it just streamlines it and therefore it reduces costs and increases my productivity. Freeconferencecalling.com is again very similar to Uber Conference. It gives you a free conference line number and you're capable of using that in order to make large calls or just one-to-one -one calls, but now you don't have to go through the effort of, of doing those things. So meeting online and teleworking is one really great avenue for being able to make a reduced cost, increasing employee engagement, increasing employee morale, and of course it has to be done right. There have to be the right metrics and the right you know, boundaries involved and the right management, but it can be a very, very successful way of running your business. So the next one's going to be sort of very different for you. There's a new movement called the sharing economy, and you might have heard about some of the companies involved in it, but this is about decreasing your carbon footprint, yes, but it's all about generating income as well through sharing. And this is the idea that you have stuff and I have stuff, and they're not the same stuff. And so once in a while, I want to use what you've got, and you want to use what I've got, but we don't really have a bartering relationship, and we don't really know each other. And so how do we actually not have to go ahead and provide more garbage for the landfill, which is I might use this product a couple times, or I might buy the same exact product you do, but we use it each half of the time. How do we, over, how do we compensate for that and potentially use each other in a, an effective way? Well, enter the, the sharing economy. So this is the idea that we have Zipcar and some other programs that I'm going to talk about right now that really help you be able to reduce costs for the company. You're increasing your green business practices, and you can potentially make some money. So let's talk about them. First up is Zipcar. Zipcar is a company that was launched in 2000, and in 2007 they merged, if you want to call it, with Flexcar. And Flexcar and Zipcar are now one company under the Zipcar brand, but I believe that Flexcar was actually larger than them. They're a car sharing company. What you can do for your business is you can create a Zipcar for business account. And in essence, get rid of your old fleet of cars. Uh, you know, and and uh, you know, once they've aged out, I, I don't think it's appropriate to just get rid of all of them. If they're good, decent cars, you don't want to put those in the landfill. But if they are capable of being sold, that's potentially some money on the books, you know, on your balance sheet that you could shift over to now a readily available cash asset. If you can sell the products, you don't have to have insurance. Zipcar covers gas, mileage, and insurance, wear and tear on the vehicle, maintenance, all of that stuff. It becomes one line item that you pay for by the hour or by the day. So if you don't, if you have a fleet of vehicles that you're using regularly, but you're only using it for, say, two hours of the day, you can get a Zipcar account and go ahead and have your, your business you know, employees use the account in order to be able to do that. There are lots of different competitors in this car sharing environment. One of them is Car2Go, they're the newest, probably the newest one I believe that's on the, on the market. And they're owned by Daimler Chrysler, the owners of, uh, owners of Mercedes. And they are all smart cars. So if you don't know what a smart car is, they're the little tiny square vehicles that fit two passengers, the driver and a passenger and have barely any uh, you know, uh, space behind you, but it's a really tiny car, looks quite, sort of uh, uh, interesting, and uh, they, can, they can actually park at the curb uh, either way, but of course that's dependent upon the jurisdiction allowing them to, but literally if you park the car with the wheels up against the curb, it's the same as if you park them with the, uh, with the passenger side or driver side two wheels against the curb. So really, really innovative little cars, and so their, their whole fleet are, are these smart cars. And uh, so we have WeCar, Hertz, Enterprise, and a bunch of other uh, organizations, large you know, rental car organizations have all created this, this kind of car sharing program for you. So even if you don't have a zip car or a car to go uh, region that's covered for you, there is definitely a car service that's in your area that's probably doing something similar to this. Next up is Relay Rides. Relay Rides is a really great option for you in terms of making money. So this is that you might own a fleet of vehicles, but you only use them once in a while. So Relay Rides is a peer-to-peer -peer car sharing program, meaning that your business, when not using those vehicles that are just sitting there, can actually be making you money. You can go ahead and list them on Relay Rides, and other people can go ahead and use those vehicles, another business or another 
uh, you know, resident that, that lives near your business can go ahead and use those cars, and that calculates income back to your business. So you can actually offset the cost of, of, a, of a major expense by just allowing people to utilize it when, when, they're not, when you're not. And uh, so that can be really, really, um, really vital. Okay? Uh, moving along, Parking Panda. If you have parking space, you can go ahead and rent out the parking space, period. If you are trying to reduce your uh, carbon imprint, save time, you can use Parking Panda to make sure that your, your clients and or customers have secure parking space before they get to you. So if you're in a busy district where you know, it's difficult to find parking, you can use Parking Panda to, to make sure that your customers know that you understand that them sitting around idling or rounding the block, every time they do that, they're just wasting more energy. And if they can reduce energy, you can calculate how much time every customer on average wastes in circling your block and trying to park. And you can use Parking Panda to basically go ahead and make that nil and therefore have a huge marketing opportunity. You can say, hey, by using Parking, you know, parking Panda, we save you X you know, square, uh, what is it, a cube, a cubic square feet of, of carbon. Uh, every year, and now you can use it on your marketing materials. So it can be really interesting to use a program like this that allows you to go ahead and do that. And of course, if you have parking, excess parking, you can go ahead and rent that parking out through Parking Panda. TaskRabbit is all about virtual assistant and the virtual assistant market. Now this is for your solopreneurs and micropreneurs, perhaps, and maybe even uh, people who hire these services on, for their employees, like concierge services. And this is the idea that you have staff that is pre-certified. These people are not only pre-certified, they, they have background checks done on them, they take tests, they are employees of this organization, TaskRabbit. They're not your employees. You don't have to deal with any of the paper or headache of what it takes to hire somebody to do particular tasks. And they're designed to be specialists in their particular area. So if you want something done, you can go ahead and use them. So this is reducing all sorts of costs and also being much more effective in getting particular things done. One other company that I really like is a company called Fancy Hands. FancyHands.com is a company that is all US-based workers, so we're not, we're not shipping jobs overseas. We have people who are local, uh, very similar to TaskRabbit. I believe the TaskRabbit's all US-based also, but I'm not sure about that. I know Fancy Hands definitely is. It's US-based, it's a New York-based company, and, uh, and the headquarters is in New York, and Fancy Hands has all of their virtual assistants in America. And so they are using American you know, employees, and they do all of your tasks for you that you submit to them. And they sort of have the best person that can do it. And you know, they, they're just very efficient in all of the things that they're doing. And so in essence, they're reducing your time, your energy, and all of those things. And I think that equates to some efficiencies within your own business. So think about how that can work for you. Amazon has a program called Mechanical Turk. And so if you work in the software world or if you're, you have some type of technical background, you can not only provide your services in this marketplace, but in the opposite side, if you're trying to get some type of development work done, you can go to this uh, site and have them go ahead and create technology for you, and that can help you reduce your green imprint. So say that you want to green some part of your technology, you can go ahead into me Mechanical Turk and for very low cost, help them fashion the green technology that you need to make it a part of your product or service or to make your operations more efficient. So this is really something that you can, you can have someone create, pre package it, brand it, and sell it as part of your product or service, or you can have them go ahead and help you green your own business practices. Really, really powerful tool. Next up is Airbnb, and I don't really have much to say about them except to say that when you're traveling, you can go ahead and lodge with real people when you're on business travel as opposed to using hotels that are not necessarily green. You know, they use huge amounts of energy, they waste all sorts of stuff, and this has been sending a message to those big uh, hoteliers that they need to green their, their businesses and make the environmental impact lessen. So HomeAway is another competitor to Airbnb, so that's, uh, that's just the same thing. And uh, then we have a place called SnapGoods. SnapGoods is all about gadgets and everything else in your life. So if you need a drill for your business, and you need a drill once every six months, well, it doesn't really make much sense for you to buy a drill and then have it sitting in a drawer. You can actually go to snapgoods.com and 
find somebody locally in your area who has a drill and you can just go rent it from them for five or twenty dollars for the day and now you've not only reduced your carbon footprint by not having to you know waste drill bits and the production of all sorts of metal and plastics and whatnot but you're also reducing your business costs and increasing your community engagement because you're actually going to meet somebody who's in the real world and they may be a potential customer. They may be someone who will refer you to someone else because they know that you're a part of the green movement. So remember that every level of these sort of sharing economy touch points is an opportunity for you to talk green with those people and therefore market. Okay? Snap Goods is really, really fun and cool, by the way, if you haven't tried it. So next up is co-working and, co and work shifting. Co-working is a movement where people are basically coming to these spaces and working together in a communal environment. This is mostly among micropreneurs and the tech techpreneurs. And the movement is because if you're working in an office by yourself, four walls, and you're, you have all of this stuff around you, but not people, it can be somewhat stagnating and you know depressing and so uh, for some people and we are social creatures and so the co-working environment basically allows entrepreneurs to meet in a communal space and work together and of course there are green benefits to that by aggregating people into a, a similar space you now have the ability to go ahead and work with a lessened environmental impact greater sociable Im impact and actually a greater marketing impact there are now green co-working spaces. I know one specifically called Green Spaces in New York City. And these spaces are all over the country. All of these sites, unless I've noted differently, are .com. So if you go to coworking.com, you will find all of the co-working sites in the country, actually the globe. And you can find these spaces in, uh, that basically allow you to come for free to check the place out. And so if you don't have an office space, and you don't need necessarily an office space every day, all day to, to have access to, then maybe a co-working space is something for you. And then you can go to perhaps an executive office space. Work shifting is just basically the idea that the nine to five is going away. We are shifting to a new paradigm where people work in different ways and so on and so forth. And then we have all of these other options. So I'm not gonna really explicate all of these. These will of course be in the, uh, in the show notes, in the, in the uh, webinar notes but we have lots of different op options in terms of being able to uh, get into an environment with other entrepreneurs and to market, okay? And then finally, I just wanted to talk about pitfalls and greenwashing. So in reverse, greenwashing is just basically the idea about being false, about being green, okay? And that's willful, okay? That's you going out there and telling people that greenwashing is happening, however, there is a segment of, uh, I think Jackie Ottman says this, that she thinks that most greenwashing is actually done by mistake, by accident. People don't realize that they're greenwashing when in essence they are. Uh, so again, you're willfully telling people that you're green, but you may not know that you're telling them falsely that you're green. And so what you have to do with greenwashing is be very specific about what area of your business is green, okay? So if, you're, if you have uh, you know, something that is reduced energy, okay, so you're using less energy. Say that more than saying, I'm a green business. People don't really hear that you're a green business. They want to hear about what specifically you're doing to impact the health and welfare of the people and the environment, okay? And then finally, substandard green practices is the idea of skipping analysis and problem solving phases from that life cycle approach that I talked about earlier. If you look at where everything touches in the, in the scope of things, you want to make sure that you are looking at each of those aspects of it and you have a response when someone says, hey, how come you're not green in this area? Well, you should have a response to that as a business and if you don't, then you're, you have sub substandard green practices and you need to be able to respond for that, okay? And substandard green practices is really, for me, I think, it's a personal sort of statement, is that it's about how you respond to that. So if you tell me that, oh yeah, we just didn't think about it, well, you've missed a marketing opportunity. If you can just coin it in a way that's appropriate for me, then I can understand that you're a small business, you, don't, you can't do everything for everybody, and this particular area of your business is somewhere that you're thinking about growing in the next two years, the next five years, whatever it might be, then it can, then it can be understood and it can be accepted, and I'll still find buy, I'll, I'll still have buy-in with your business in all of the other areas that you're doing, energy, 
you know, impact, uh, carbon impact, or whatever it is that you're trying to lessen, I can sort of have that, I can have that buy-in on that level. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy. Tracy, if you have anyone with questions, I'm happy to answer those questions, and then we can wrap up. Okay, thanks, Ray. Um, so far, we don't have any questions. Do we have any questions from anyone? Well, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up, and if we get any questions while I'm kind of going through some housekeeping issues or items, then we'll, um, we'll go ahead and ask them if that sounds okay. Great. Well, thanks, everyone, for participating today. Um, today's webinar was recorded, and it will be posted on the new Virginia SBDC website under training. There is a link for live webinars and recordings. Tomorrow you'll be receiving a follow-up email on this webinar, and there'll be an evaluation link in the email. Please help us to continue to improve our training by taking the time to complete the evaluation. If you want to complete the evaluation now, I've um, put the link in the chat window. You can go ahead and click on that and, and complete it for us. We'd much appreciate it. Our next webinar will be at the same time, 10.15 on March 7th, and it's Managing Your Content Well. Um, so. Since we don't have any questions, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up for today. Thanks, Ray. Thanks so much, Tracy. Thanks, everybody.